I'm not going to get your podcast canceled. No. Foam rolling your dick for half an hour, which may feel nice. Sounds terrible, but I can explain. They were having sex with each other, having myself look at lots of people naked, and hopefully that's for your dick, isn't yeah. it? This is the best place in the world to see me <laughs> naked. If your dick's lean, you're good, bro. Are we getting canceled yet? Straight out the left. Today we are joined by the co-founder of Renaissance, Peter Isation, a PhD in sports physiology and a beacon in the realms of strength, training and nutrition. With his groundbreaking work guiding athletes from the gym to the podium, my guest breaks down the science of peak performance into clear, actionable advice. Today he's here to challenge the misconceptions and enlighten us with his expert insights into building muscle, losing fat and everything in between. Get ready for a transformation conversation with Dr. Mike Isratel. Did I get your last name right? You did. Wow. Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Flex. Huge honor. M- Matt, it's been, uh, been a minute since, since you and I met. We met you at the Dragon's Lair, correct? I only know of you to exist in the Dragon's Lair. That's a good I'm, thing. I've allegedly, you've won Olympias. I've never seen them. I know that a dragon gave birth to you at some point, <laughs> and in that... Uh, birthplace was a gym also that built around it to house you and to make you the most Welsh man alive. Well, I could say you're the second. Yeah. With that accent that you've yeah. been working on very hard. I, f- I have, I have an, I have a Welsh accent. I can try on. Let, let's just get it off, get it, kick the show off with the Welsh accent. Let's go. So just a quick preface. Yes. Um, I, when I do my flex impression, because that's actually what it is. I don't have a Welsh accent. I have a flex impression. And I make you a lot angrier than normal because it sounds cool. And you say irrational things. Like, for example, Oi, you come to me, Jim? <laughs> you got to fight me, dragon? And you're like, what, 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 do I, what do you mean? Shut up. You've got to have some sense coming in here. My name's Flex. I've won like 100 Olympias or something. Got quite old, didn't it? Man, they, they keep on getting worse every time I see Isn't it them. terrible? They got- it's getting cockney at this point. Scottish. Who cares? A little Braveheart and mixed in the vault. I thought Braveheart was Welsh. No, Scottish, unfortunately. Who was cool that was Welsh, other than you? Tom Jones. Who the fuck Tom Jones? Come, come on, bro. Random name. What's up, pussycat? Nope. No, nothing. Not registering. Catherine Zita Jones. Yo, what's up? Is she Welsh for real? Yeah. Yo, flex. There we go. So you you got to get a connect. I can name about 100 sheep, too, but <laughs> we won't go down that road. We're kicking <laughs> off this podcast on a high. I know it. Um, you've been here for a number of years now, correct, at the Dragon's Lair? Every time we come to Las Vegas, Nevada, which is a few times a year to film for RP YouTube, mm-hmm. um, the Dragon's Lair tends to be at the very top of the list of the gyms we go to film at. Tend to be. Tend to be. Because it's every now and again, Flex, to be completely honest, the Dragon scares me, bro. <laughs> That's my wife. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Hey, listen. He said it. I didn't say it. Um... <laughs> It's just really difficult to beat a couple things about the Dragon Slayer. One is the physical availability of equipment. It's awesome. Also, after you expand to that leg room, it's insane. Another thing is, like, there's just so many hardcore lifters that are here. It's like one of those gyms where almost the average member is an IFBB pro, which is strange Mm. and super, super motivating and inspiring. And because you're here and you have such a positive attitude and you're such a, I don't know, a lot of people have told me, like, they don't know who you are or they they know of you and they're nobody's, quote unquote, and you just come up and chat with them in the middle of the workout and they're like, oh, that was amazing. Oh, yeah, Flex is like a nice guy. And then they say, oh, you proposition them for rude things, pictures, text messages. It just keeps going. I know. But at least at first, you're super nice. It goes downhill fast, though. Very fast. Just like when you met me. Just when I wanted it, Flex. (laughs) Now now it's a big arc to avoid (laughs) me in the gym. But no, it's great to have you, you're mad. And and, um, you were a member, you at one point in time. Just before. I'm, I'm a member currently. Every oh. time we show up, I buy a month at least. But during the end of the COVID era, we were here for like a year yes. because my wife was a sports medicine doctor and she was doing her fellowship here. And so we were here training basically almost every day. Yeah, it was sad to leave you. You came to me because we just became friends at that point in time. Yep. You said, I'm leaving. Yep. And you had just opened the gym, really. Yeah. I was coming to the gym a little bit before the official opening. That's right. Because Jared uh, snuck me in through the back. As he tends to take me that, many places. That back door. Oh, I've been to the back door with Jared many times. No, wait, wait, I said that wrong. <laughs> or <laughs> so did might. I? Mm. So might. So we, obviously there's been a lot of changes here in the gym. You mentioned, you know, the leg room. But um, talking of change on that note, 
you know, with the fitness industry, there's been a tremendous amount of change. And um, with yourself in the last decade, what have you seen the most from the science perspective in regards to athletes and bodybuilding? So from the science perspective, we, we could take this a few different ways. One is training, one is nutrition, and one is supplementation, we'll say the nice term. I think it was for a long time already established that real high-level guys will have a supplement coach. Otherwise, it's confusing, peaking is very difficult, so on and so forth. Right around the time, maybe a few years after, people really got to understanding that a supplement coach is someone you need, they also realized the diet coach is a big part of that because supplements and diet are so closely aligned in professional and competitive bodybuilding. So a lot of guys would have diet coach, supplement coach. Here I'm thinking someone like Chad Nichols, for example. Right? Then only later, but in the last 10 years, are people really starting to move over into trying to be coached into and formalizing their training. Because it used to be like, you know, your athlete, you run their farm, you run their supplements, you run their diet, and then their training, you just kind of know the split and you arrange everything to that. Mm. But it turned out we know enough in the scientific community to really inform about training because there's kind of two roads in training. One is the road of doing what you like, what you want, and there's not a goddamn thing wrong with that. The other road is of doing what you have to in order to get your best possible results. Mm. I've taken second place enough time in my life to know that it's important to try, if you want, to do the thing that is more formal, more official, more ingrained, more written down, more manipulated, potentially coached by someone else, because then you can really go to the show, know that your supplements are in line, you're eating all the right things at the right times, and you did everything like you were supposed to in training. Because if you look back on your training for a couple of months, you could be like, oh man, I I could have pushed it harder. But hold on, maybe harder would have been too hard. You've seen guys overdo it and then show up looking flat and uh, injured. So there's this balancing act of how hard do I go? How much do I restrain it? Very tough to do yourself. Easier to do with the RP hypertrophy app. Download now. <coughs> link, link in the bio. Link in bio. <laughs> but um, very easy to do with a coach. And so over the last 10 years in the fitness industry, I feel like people are paying attention more and more and more to technique, to periodization, to progression. People like um, Justin Shire, people like a John Jewett, real meticulous about how they execute their training. Mm. And I think that's really starting to catch on. And my best informational source for where to pick stuff like that up is TikTok. One 15 second reel that I've learned enough for a lifetime of training. That's actually, people say Dr. Mike, but it's more of a nickname. I actually got my PhD on TikTok. Did you know that if you watch 10 million reels, they just send you a PhD in the mail? Come on. They have to be training related reels. Oh, dumb. That's why I went wrong. Yeah, you probably have a few nutrition in there. You're like a couple reels shy of a PhD. Yeah, it's not, actually, it's not even in the genre, but... <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, I thought TikTok was a Christian platform <laughs> with family values. Oh, where do you go with this? We started off the show in a bad direction. We're fucking, you're pulling me back hey, in. listen, you know. Pulling me back in. So, no, you're talking about the coaching and, and nutritional um, coach too. You, you do everything yourself, right? It's, it's all pretty much, I, I know you jokingly said about the, the app, but... Truly, that app is has been incredible for so many different people, and that and I mean, I remember finding out about this app probably about a year and a half ago. Yeah, yeah, that's when it came out, and, and it and it's blown up. Obviously, Nick Walker is part of it. Obviously, sure. Jared Frether, they're sure. big contributors to the app. But you put daily content on that, if I'm not mistaken. So correct? what I do is I stay in touch with a team of engineers, and we're always evolving the app and making it better. So I do that all the time. Yeah. But um, most of my daily work is really just posting to my OnlyFans, you know, responding to people. We're back there again. Requests. Sorry, that was fast. Uh, no, the app's been awesome. And the app basically allows you to, to train yourself however you want. You put in all the exercises you like. And then it gives you a certain number of sets to do with certain mm-hmm. weight, certain reps. You can change them anytime you like. But then as the weeks progress, the app strategically adds a rep here, adds a five pounds here, adds or takes away a set here, depending on how you're recovering and progressing. So, for example, if you're smashing it and you're getting up and really tired, the app will pull back for you based on how you rate it, of course. Because if you tell it, like, at the end of shoulders, it's like, could you have done any more? And you're like, nope, that was nuts. Next time it'll pull back on it. If you're, everything's going steady, esteem, nothing's the problem. It just stays the course. And if it seems like you're not being challenged enough, uh, it'll increase the amount of work you do for you. So it keeps you in that middle line that everything is just, what do they say? Like you've been in a bunch of preps. Everything's just clicking. 
right? Yeah. That's what the app is trying to get you to because yeah. how much to train and how to train and how to progress, it's not an instantly answerable question. There's so much variation. Mm -hmm. Some person needs four sets of chest, they get super sore. Some person needs eight sets of chest and that's what gets them going. Some guy will get to 12 sets of chest and be like, I can absolutely do more and still recover. The app detects that based on your feedback mm -hmm. and it escalates or de-escalates how fast the progressions go. Not to show an age, Joe, but coming from the old school, mm -hmm. having Neil Hill, mm -hmm. it was very hard for me when I moved to the United States to work virtually, just sending pictures. Sure. So working with him in person, that's how we were able to change different things the technology has grown tremendously now yeah. where, you know, we're talking about the details in the engineering that your engineer has put into this app alone where minuscule changes based on honest feedback. Yes, it has to be honest. Yeah. If you lie to the app, I don't even know what to tell you. It's just going to assume you're like, oh, you're immortal. Yeah. Here's 10 sets of everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're going to put yourself into a... Sure. Also, keep lying too. You're not going to make any progression. Who That's knows? another thing too. Absolutely. But you've also I mentioned two names earlier, John Feather, both IBB Pros and Nick Walker. They're advanced athletes. Very. So even people of that stature can do, you know, uh, work with this app too, correct? 100%. I use the app for my own personal uh, training as well. The thing is, another coach can look at how you use the app and help guide you in its use. Mm -hmm. And also, be, the app doesn't look at you naked and tell you where to push and pull the carbs. You know, it doesn't do that. <laughs> I'm working on it. AI. I've been, I've been coaching the app by having myself look at lots of people naked, and hopefully the app will absorb some of that wisdom. But uh, yeah, the app is kind of a tool you can use in, a, in conjunction with personal mm -hmm. coaching to get the best experience. But I will say, you know, nothing's really going to beat ne the Neil Hill looking at you in yeah. real life. Uh, but Neil Hill probably doesn't cost $30 a month. So if you want to get your pro card or win the Olympia a few times, give Mr. Neil Hill a call. <laughs> if you want, uh, if you have a little less money and your aspirations aren't exactly mega maniacal, then uh, that, I think the app is great. Yeah. Well, that's the evolution, right, of, of where the fitness industry has gone now. You know, working with an app, working with uh, a virtual coach, like I was saying earlier, it was only one way for me, and I was working in person with Neil, and me living in a town which was one hour away, I had to drive every time Neil gave me my in-person check-in, sometimes twice a week. Wow. So it was one hour there, one hour back, two-hour round trip, just for Neil to be like, okay, you're on point. But that's how I worked, and I wouldn't have thought of any other way. Um... But again, now when you came, I've come to the United States, pretty much everybody has a virtual coach. The U.S. is so big, man. I, I like it when European friends come to uh, visit the U.S. And some of them are like, oh, yeah, we're going to see New York and then D.C. and then Chicago. <laughs> yeah. And they didn't, don't do it. someone didn't look up the driving time. They're like, oh, my God, it's 11 hours to Chicago. Like, yeah. Even flying time. Is like, Even flying time. Wait, six five? hours from New York to Vegas. You're like, what, what the hell? No this is the same country. Yeah. I thought I could drive there. 30 For minutes sure. away. I will say... There is something, if you can, if you, uh, if, if you for, for example, if you live uh, in Las Vegas and you're prepping for an important show and you have a really good prep coach, and let's say you train out of the Dragon's Lair, you guys have like two posing rooms or something? At, at well, least one. Yeah. And also the rest of your gym really is a posing room, <laughs> to be honest, because of the lighting so sweet. One and one big one. Yes. Yes. If you want to see Dr. Mike half naked, uh, this is the best place in the world to see me <laughs> half naked randomly. But I will say, if you are in that position where your coach lives in Vegas, you live in Vegas, for example... Having a coach look at you in real life, it's better than in pictures mm -hmm. because, first of all, the judges will see you in real life. Flex, have you ever had it to where someone looked amazing in pictures and then you see him in real life on show day, a competitor or something, and you're like, eh. Yeah, it's a high percentage. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> sure. There's a lot of filters. I underhand days. lobbed that one too. Yes. So... Even if you don't filter your coaching communications, the placing of the camera, the lighting, what's behind you, blah, blah, blah. If your coach can see you in real life, you also know the following thing, probably, Flex, better than I do. When you're there, there for conditioning, you've arrived, there's a different look to your body. Mm. Grainy, whatever the you want to call it. That shit is different. And sometimes it is clear from pictures, but sometimes it isn't. One of the things I've heard about um, Sean Clarita, for example... Jared was in the um, back room with Sean. That sounds terrible, but I can explain. They were having sex with each other. No, wait, wait. That's the opposite of what they were doing. Sean was getting his tan finished, and Jared was like, dude, every picture you've ever seen of him winning the Olympia does him a disservice. Yeah. Because in real life, the shit just doesn't look human. He looks nutty. He has, he has like, veins in his upper glutes. How? 
where, what, how, why. So I think that, you know, when you drove all those times to see Neil, was it a huge use of time? Yes. Is virtual coaching amazing for tons of people? Yes. But is there something special to see in a human being who knows what they're looking at, by the way? Absolutely. Another thing I'll say while I'm ranty really quick, Neil has like a gajillion total number of athlete years of experience. A lot of people pretend they're good coaches. Like I don't even coach. I suck at coaching. A lot of people pretend they're good coaches. They sort of like a monkey see monkey do. What does a good coach do? He sees the guy in real life, man. He goes, yeah, man, that's really good. Try to open up your lats a little bit. But what is it that you're really looking at? Somebody like Neil could give you the real deal. Be like, yeah, you're three weeks out. Or he could be like, we need to push it harder. Or he could be like, dude, chill out, fill out a little bit because you're getting really depleted. Yeah. A lot of people just don't know what they're looking at. So they play the pretend game of like, yeah, I need to see my athletes check in all the time. It's like, shut the fuck up. No, you don't. You don't even know what you're looking for. Yeah. So that's oh. me, me talking shit. No, no, no. Listen, there's a lot of truth to it. Again, unfortunately, you know, the doors, I feel like, uh, like the border right now. Of <laughs> There's a flood of people who have placed eighth place in their show yep. and know that a coach, right? And they're kind of ripping protocols from the internet and changing them however they want to change sure. them. There's like, it's so far from where I started in the simplicity of everything. Sure. You know, it, keep it simple, stupid, right, Kiss? But Neil plays that game and he'll always play that game. There's never been any type of uh, crazy concoction week or... Any mm-hmm. type of shit loading or everything else. The yeah. same foods we, we ate in prep is what we're carving up on. We're taking every issue out of the equation. Yeah. I've st- uh, in my own bodybuilding journey, which has been lackluster, um, I've gotten more and more away from last minute bullshit. Because I used to think like, oh, there's a science to this last minute bullshit, which there is. But complexity by itself is a stressor. And you can't track all the variables at the same time. So what I'm doing more recently is just... My goal is to get on in stage shape two or three weeks out and then just eat the same normal meals, eat the same meal I normally would in the morning, go up, go on stage. Because then you know you're going to look how you're going to look. Because if you're trying to peak, there is absolutely uh, some chance that your weird protocol is just going to make you look absurd, way better than ever. Mm -hmm. But there's also a chance it's going to make you look worse. For all that shit that you're doing in your protocol, that's a lot of risk. And look, I'm an amateur competitor. I'm just trying to, like, you know, get at Masters Nationals a few times before I hang it up. Somebody like an Olympian, man, can you imagine looking like the man the day before and then yeah. taking fifth at the Olympia the day of? be a disaster. Yeah. So that simple approach has a ton of merit behind it. Yeah, and, and the most of the top five guys that I know of, I would say, you know, maybe into the top ten, they've all changed their ways over the years. It's gone back to simplicity. There, there's no kind of Hail Mary at the last end unless they're looking like shit, right? And they're trying to re- do something yeah. drastic. So it's it's been, I think, through trial and error for a lot of these guys. Thankfully, I've had the same coach since I was 19. We've not done anything wild. But when I see or hear some of these guys that have, you know, oh, it's just water. It's like, oh, it's not, bro. It's not water. You, you're like of fucking four stuff. weeks out. But yeah, for sure. <laughs> but again, it's who around, who's around you and, and what is your standard of competition shape. Sure. And a lot of these guys are so skilled thinking they have to be a certain weight. Well, I, think I that did that for years, man. Yeah. The thing that people forget about bodybuilding is that the judges are simply not even availed to that information. <laughs> they don't know what you weigh. And... They don't really care. It's a purely visual sport. So if you weigh 230 on stage, but you got a little bit of loose something or other going on in the lower back, upper glutes, Mm -hmm. you're going to look great. If you weigh 215, but you're dry as shit and your waist comes down even more, Mm -hmm. the judges are going to be like, you, show us your number there. 14, got it. Middle of the pack. Who gives a f- and a lot of guys I've actually I'm a little bit friends with a few IFBB pros, a few of them. Uh, you know, I'm like that girl like you know when you have like a hookup buddy and she's like yeah we're friends you're like I'm not really friends. <laughs> it's like that. <laughs> I claim she you. Comes I over claim you. Every other Friday <laughs> when I don't have anything else going on. <laughs> um, but um, I've corresponded with a few of them, and one of them uh, won a pro show this past year I believe and. I hit him up and I was like, dude, like out of just sheer curiosity, what do you weigh? And this is a guy who was like enormous. And I've weighed 225 on stage before, 220, looking like whatever, lean and big, but not Mm -hmm. quite contest. Dude, he was like, uh, I weighed 226 and it blew my mind because this guy's like 21 inch arms or something totally insane. You just 
you'd look at it and you're like, that doesn't look like 226. Mm-hmm. It looks like 250. But that's exactly the point. The judges will rank you wherever the f- you're supposed to be. Dexter Jackson won the overall Mr. Olympia before. Who gives a shit how much he weighed? Yeah, Ask the person in two seconds if it matters. I think he's in the 220. Yeah, I, I, I want to say. A variety of claims have been made. Yeah. Flex, it, let me ask you a question. Actually, is there even a scale back there when you guys are pumping up? No. So when people say, like, I weighed X, Y, Z, it's like, earlier that morning, on the hotel scale, maybe, <laughs> maybe, an idea. I swear to God, half scale it's made up. I yeah. just, dude, if I ever turn pro, I'd be like, yeah, man, I turn pro at 290, I'm going to really try to turn it up and get to 308, you know. When I think the 2000s um, really kind of put a, a spoke in the in the works there, because remember they yes. were weighing ever being at the IAMAN, yeah, and mm-hmm. everybody would go in, like some people would peel off, and then the bigger guys would peel off, and then yeah. the kind of the... You know, the Hamid Haidars and stuff would go in with their shoes on, their, their clothes on, it. like Sean Clarira, right? I love it. But um, I think that really kind of put a, kind of something in people's head where it's like, oh, if you're not this weight in the open class, yeah, you're not going to do well. Not to talk shit. Oh, boy, here we go. But the 2000s, the late 90s and the 2000s produced some unbelievable physiques. They also produced a small but notable handful of physiques that were like, hey, you figured out how to really fill that vial up and push it into your body, including synthol, I might add. And then it was kind of like the mass monster freak era did a lot of good. Gosh, for the soul of the sport. Everyone wants to see Marcus Rule. I don't give who you are. But there was a bit of that where a lot of guys were pushing that size game so much that they lost track of conditioning to some extent, definitely lost track of shape. And um, at some point, I think in the 2010s plus, there was a bit of a revival that I think still continues to this day of kind of you have to bring the whole package. And um, who won the Olympia last year? Derek Lunsford. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, that's wild, that look. His waist is the same size as when he was like 170, Mm -hmm. except he weighs like 220 or some shit like that. That is a look. Even um, Big Rami, like for how big he is. Quite good aesthetics, I will say. Yeah. And that's kind of the future of the sport because I think back in the early 2000s and, and, and late 90s and stuff, not so much the champions, but a lot of people that were doing well, it was one of these things where you're like, you're a bodybuilder. It's like, that's right. But you have a huge gut. Like, yeah, comes with the territory. Like, does it though? I get you could be a pro with a huge gut. Uh, like, I have a giant gut, just dog shit genetics. But I'm not trying to say I have a very good physique. If you want to be an Olympian, I think you probably have to have it all including yeah. a tight waist, and then your scale weight isn't the same as it used to be. But again, who gives a shit? You're supposed to be jacked. It's all visual. Do you think the PEDs back then were just ballistic? It was like more the better that caused these physiques to go, you know, because we, listen, you mentioned a couple, of, you know, we don't have to name names, but Ronnie was the king, right? King Ronnie. And genetically, you know. I have an awful Ronnie impression, by the way. Oh, you can do that too. But I know everybody was chasing Ronnie, right? So yeah. it was kind of, it was kind of that era of, Yep. Size, size, size. Yes. And you've seen yes. guys who had beautiful symmetri- symmetrical physiques who just destroyed their waistline. And as you said, bellies. And yes. it was trying to chase the king. Um, and as you mentioned, the revival now, I feel, is is coming into its own. Yes. Classic physique has helped. But yes. Going back to my question, do you think it was that era of chasing the goat that caused uh, the physiques to go out of hand and more is better? I have to imagine that's a big part of it. At the end of the day, people will look sooner or later, like what the judges reward. I remember even back then a few times the judges were like, made a statement, like the IFBB, no offense, made a statement like, hey guys, we're going to be looking for more streamlined physiques. And then the very next year, like they still rewarded the mass monsters and people were like, duh. The only way you can make a statement is by picking who is champion, who is top five, who is top 10. And if a lot of the guys that have the size and they have the conditioning, but they don't have the symmetry, so to speak, the small waist, et cetera, the lines, you should see those guys placing out of their usual spots. For example, some guy places third and fourth all the time. Let's say even at the Olympia, just jacked monster, freak, got the whole thing. If you're serious about the Olympia becoming more aesthetic, in the next year he has to place seventh or ninth or some shit, and then he's going to be like, what the f- his fans are going to be like, oh, Rob, bro, they say that about everyone. And then after that, the IFB could be like, yes, we are absolutely serious about rewarding aesthetic physiques. Mm-hmm. And of course, it's nice to give the guys a year ahead of time so they can drop the growth hormone dose down a little. <laughs> JK, 
<laughs> Why would anyone drop that? Um, but yeah, Flex, to your point, it is absolutely uh, an effect of chasing Ronnie was the seeing like where the judges are rewarding Ronnie and they're rewarding other huge guys. And then everyone who's been in the game long enough knows that a lot of body weight comes down to milligrams. You take more milligrams of gear, you will be heavier, and most of it will be muscle slash fluid in the muscle. And so guys were like, look, like if I'm competing under 250 pounds, I'm not placing. The given Olympias to monsters and top fives and pro shows to monsters, time to go up. And then if they go up and they successfully place better, what do you think they learn from that? They're like, well, shit. But I'm still not dead. <laughs> My cardiologist still says hello to me when we meet at the store. He doesn't just shun me because I don't want to be seen with that guy. That guy's going to die tomorrow. Uh, then up it goes again. And then you get that kind of spiral effect. And the only way to bring down the spiraling effect of kind of excessive gear use is to bring the conditioning and symmetry standard such that it reflects it. Like, is if Sebum took more gear would he look better? No, absolutely not. He would look weirder and his gut would be a bit distended. And that's not a look he wants. So it turns out like uh, if you put the standard of the best physique to the kind that doesn't look like everyone's on a boatload of shit, that's the best way to set that standard. But you have to but you have to stick to it. Don't own I, it. I, I will say I was at the <laughs> Olympia this past year and I saw a um I saw the Miss Olympia which they had back this past year, right? The the actual bodybuilding, the female bodybuilding. And um, what is her name? Michaela something or other? Yeah, Michaela shredded. She looked like some kind of cyborg experiment. Unbelievable. Peeled. She had glute striations walking back from the posing area. Yeah. And I was like, what the? F totally different level. She took like fifth or something. Because they straight up told the girls, and it was common knowledge, we are not pushing a conditioning standard. Oh, really? Uh, that's what I heard. They're pushing a standard of balance, of symmetry, of femininity, of beauty, and of muscularity. Hmm. That's, the, that's the actually the, on the PDF that describes the division. Personally, in my heart, of course I want Michaela to win. As soon as she walked on stage, I damn near shit my pants. I was like, Crystal. I told my wife, look at that. She's yeah. like, oh my God. But... If you have a conditioning standard and a judging standard, you got to stick to it. So I don't think she was surprised. She was probably just like, well, I am the leanest person of all time or some shit. But there's a different standard than all the other ladies know. This is where we're going. They're not going to push that extreme blah, blah, blah. And, and so it goes. So it's easy to say, well, the guys take too much gear. And then you reward the guy that weighs 290 all the time. What do you think everyone else is going to do? Yeah. But if you know, the guy's taking too much gear and you reward Derek Lunsford, who weighs 220, then it starts to be like, okay, maybe, 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 I, maybe I don't have to weigh 280 to beat the guy. And then the sport evolves. Well, the 212 guys are rocking the show right now. Both Hardy and Derek moving up in the open, having that trademark conditioning in the 212 and bringing it up. I think that has definitely helped the new perspective of, of what that champion should look like. Again, you know, not that Derek isn't a, a freak of nature, because obviously he is on that frame, what, five foot six, five foot seven, whatever it is, and, Crazy. and looking what he's done um, since moving up from the 212 class. And obviously Hardy, too. Um, both guys, I would guess, in the 220s. Would you think so? I Probably. flex you much better at this than I am, because I, I hear things, and I don't know who to believe. I heard that Hardy was like 245. But mm. when you when you see someone that jacked, you like, I could believe a lot of shit. Yeah. I, like, right now, you're super jacked. I could believe you weigh 180. I could believe you weigh 230. 180. I don't know. 180. I'm going to turn this sorry. podcast into a different I, direction, I'm bro. sorry, Flex. I meant 150. <laughs> I'm just with you at this point. Like, shut, shut your mouth. Oh, sick. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, going back to what we were saying about with the Olympian and, <clears throat> and, and the, the judging standard, for me, obviously, coming from uh, a completely different upbringing, I was never going to be the biggest guy on stage. Conditioning was always something I had to suffer from. And then I see some of these open-class guys, especially competing as a 212, placing in the top six. And in my my world that I come from, six weeks out, four weeks out in some cases. Yeah. And then you think to myself, well, if they're awarding this in one category and then they're going for another look in the open, it was it was very confusing for, for us Super confusing. Even though we're both bodybuilders, right? Yeah. You're not talking about men's physique or classic, which right. was introduced later on. Yeah. We're talking about bodybuilders. So keeping one class in that guideline, judging guideline, and then seeing the open in another guideline, 
It gave no 212 a reason to go up. Why would you? You say, okay, I'm having trouble making the 212s, which means I'm possibly, if I run my prep a little differently, I could come in and step on stage at 225. That's pretty common. You fill out more. You don't pull all the all the certain kinds of gear out, et cetera. But if you come in at 225 and nobody below 260 wins the Olympia, you're going to kind of be like, what the, the is this just for shits and giggles that I'm doing this? Uh, a really great recent example was uh, John Jewett, actually. John was making, he was, he's 5'7", for real, for real. Like, I've met him in real life. He's taller than me. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing physique. But you can tell, man, 212 is a long way for them to go. He's, he's jacked. I don't know how he made it. I have no idea how he made it. Neither does he. <laughs> he's talked about that a few times. That at some point he was like, you know what? I'm going to try going for an open show. And I think he either took second or won an open pro show. I think first or second, I believe. First Correct. or second. Correct. And uh, to his credit, no, I think he qualified for the Olympia. And to yeah. his credit, he took. Uh, he's now taking another year to really like fill into the open the open pro ranks because it turns out, yeah, at like 230, 240, he actually can slay a lot of them. And that's true because they're looking for John's physique. They're looking for someone with crazy mass, of course, but he also has lines, he's got detail, he's got it all. Whereas before, I feel like maybe in the late 90s, you could have been pretty lean, but if you didn't have that masser size, yeah. you were like, eh, eh. And I think another thing is, that was the time of the magazines. And in the magazines, reports of body weight oh, mattered. Flex, you were not that reading this shit. Oh, like XYZ weighs 280, and you're like, fuck. You step on the scale, and you're like 230. You're like, fuck. 180. Right, 180, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and so it's, um, I think nowadays, with social media, something that surprised me is I was expecting bodybuilders who post a lot of social media, physique updates, expect them to post their body weights more. And they don't often do that. Yeah, true. Yeah, and they post mostly just their physiques. And I think that's actually pretty sweet for the culture. Now, as a nerd, scientist, autist like myself, um, I want to see the numbers, right? But the numbers are great if you know how to contextualize them. And say, this is what this person weighs. It's cool to know. But they can warp your mind if there's no context. Or if your context is like, well... 280 is just what people have to weigh to win this thing. And yeah. here I go, plus plus five daily tabs of Anadrol or some shit like that. <laughs> Jeez. Just kidding. That's a lot of Anadrol. Yeah, we're not condoning any of that, right? Okay. But if he is, that's on him. I'm, I'm absolutely condoning it if you want to really take your health and just kick it in the gut. Oh, fuck. You know, and your health is coming back from the bar, like holding its stomach, throwing <laughs> yeah. up every three blocks. That's you. That was my, without the uh, Anadrol, that was my stomach every day going into every one of my Olympias, too. It's horrible. That sucks, <laughs> man. It was. But did it reduce your appetite so that you weren't a s starving uh, I was, for prep? I had zero appetite. I it's woke kind of up. A superpower. No. No, when you wake up with <laughs> Not when it's zero. <laughs> no, when you have zero appetite, nausea, and stomach issues. It was kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back. That I stayed sucks. in there long enough. But to it was win. not long enough to you seven. Know. What did you win? Seven. Yeah, it was. It was threw out the seven, and then when I went up into the open, uh, trying to force feed myself, you know, f three to four blended shakes a day of chicken breast and rice was F that. Yeah. Hey, would you? Were you a big eater when you were growing up? No. You do you not like food? At I time? hated food, and I end up in a sport that revolves around the dinner table. Work that out. That sucks. It does. At least dieting is not as hard as it could be for you. Dieting was easy up until probably six. Six to four weeks out. And then, so there was a couple of changes that happened for me. More, I just got exhausted. Yes. It wasn't the appetite problems at that point in time. It was just getting through my day, especially six weeks out, because I was sitting ready, and I'll show you photos of the show, 224, 226, yeah. and I was ready, ready, ready. Oh, I remember those photos. I remember, Flex, way before I knew you, way before I had a PhD, we were looking at pictures of you a few weeks out from one of the Olympias. And you're like, yeah, 223 here. And I was like, where the f is 11 pounds supposed to come off this know. man's body? I provided the numbers for you, though. Oh, yeah. See? <laughs> I, I, you spoiled yeah, the shit out of me. <laughs> see? Um, and I don't know, mate. I just left it to the master in control. And, and yeah. thankfully, you know, that guy gl guided me in. But uh, I still had my cheat day once a week, too, during that period, just to keep that metabolism spiked. And What did you eat during your cheat day? I, I ate, excuse me, um, the same tried and tested stuff because of my glute, my, my, my issues, my stomach. I'd have sushi. Okay. Um, and sometimes I had to force my cheat meal in me. Whoa. Yeah. And this psycho, Neil Hill, love him to death, just to clarify that. When he was living in the UK and I was, myself and Ali was dating, I'd get to my 
cheat day. I made my numbers on the scale, which was two pounds a week. And again, I'm a monk. I don't cheat. I didn't miss anything. And I wanted to see that when I woke up in the morning. I'd get up early, jump on that scale. If I st- still wasn't on the scale, you know, I was like trying to force a shit out or something, you know. And then it's, ah, yes, the number's there. Yeah. I would text him. And he was like, okay, I want you to have a few cheat meal tonight. Yeah. And that is whatever you want. Or you tell me whatever you or eat a cheat meal. Yeah. And then a couple of hours later, because I'm a basket case, I would look forward to this cheat meal for six days. On that day, I would talk myself out of it. So I'm texting him. I was like, hey, can we push it back to tomorrow? I think I can go one more day hard. Just to prove to yourself that you could? A couple of uh, versions. Maybe it was just I'm a crazy from prep. Um, but yes, that too. Along with I like suffering. Yeah. And I felt like I didn't suffer enough. Even though I did. I didn't suffer enough. Or I could have pushed hard in training. I, I was so in my own head in all yeah. my preps. I didn't really enjoy much of my Olympia wins, to be honest. Because I was still, you know. <laughs> Here's an Olympia. You're like, who, who the f*** are you? They're like, Flex, you're on stage. Like, oh, shit. Yeah. Finally, it's yes. here. <laughs> did I win? They're like, yes. Here's your, here's your trophy. You're like, oh, God. Oh, I've got cardio tomorrow morning. <laughs> That's like, all you was. actually don't. <laughs> I was a madman. And I did. I did. I you got did. up in the morning the next morning because I had some sort of cheat that next day. And I yes. felt, because I also had to be at Korea the next week yeah, and, sure and re-weigh in again of course against different athletes who couldn't get visas in the United States so I had my own battle next the week Koreans at 212 are fell legs, legs dangerous girls. man but um, this is how crazy Neil was he'd have Ali my wife take a photo or video to prove I was eating that cheat meal all the way in the UK send it to him all in the UK and then he'd wake up look at it and say okay good and go back to bed she takes a picture of you with a bunch of sushi you're like you got it honey she's like yep send you're like <laughs> Just throw it away. I never did that part. Thank I was already committed. Because she was like, oh, can we eat something? Nothing but sushi after this Olympia prep. Yeah. Because every cheat meal was a sushi meal. But yeah, that's that's what I used to have. And um, I made the weight. That's the bottom line here. But yeah. listen, we've talked about bodybuilding and, and everything else. But what I love about you, outside your great sense of humor, uh, is you put so much information out there, science-based. And you love to debunk a lot of the bro, bro, oh, bro shit out there. Uh-uh. But you do it with such a... It's it's a very tactful, funny, and educational way. You can say something, and then you'll go around it, and then land the plane where it's like, "How can I not like this guy? He just talks shit about oh, me." But jeez, you know, flex, but, you're you're bumping me up too much. I man. am, I'm I am, I am. Ball here <laughs> live on your podcast. You're like, "Hey, debunk this." I'm like, "Bros are idiots." I just sit there. You're like, "Oh, very well." That's well, it. Okay. That's Doctor Mike. <laughs> finish it up. Finish it up with something funny. No, but that's true though. You definitely have this ability to deliver a message science-based and also have a little sprinkle of fun on, on on a serious note but then there's some reels that i've i followed you on and watched over you know last year and a half maybe longer more than that where there's great humor which oh, as as a, a fel, you know as a brit i truly love that i love it i there were some folks visiting of course the dragon's lair two days ago and they were from the UK, and I instantly was, like, the funniest person in the room to them. <laughs> because, like, dude, no joke, real talk. Like, I meet regular American people. Yeah, okay, see, so here's my personality. If you meet me anywhere and you talk to me for the first time or the 50th, there's a very high probability I'm going to try to say some shit to make you try to laugh a little bit. I can't stay serious for so long. But with, like, Americans, with many other people, um, you know, man, just so easy to step on toes when you're joking. And I think my philosophy is if you're joking, it's all good. Just to put this in perspective, one of my training partners in jiu-jitsu is Janae Kroc. Do you know who that is? So it's formerly Matt Krokoleski, best powerlifter ever. Now female Janae, trans. And so I started training with Janae, and I was like, Janae, real talk. Like, what's cool to joke about? And she's like, if it's a joke, everything. Wow. If it's serious, we're going to fist fight. And I was like, Okay. Yeah. So I look around the gym a little bit, like, insert joke here that I only said to Janae, I'm not going to get your podcast canceled. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And she's laughing. And then she layered on other jokes at her own expense. I was like, this is dope. Yeah. So like, I think sometimes Americans are the, the nicest people in the world. Yeah. They're so nice that sometimes humor, they kind of maybe forget that jokes are jokes or they just don't know. But it, the, man, the British people of the British Isles. <laughs> everything's humor to them and there's no bottom like it's just totally like see who can say the most up shit and it's all jokes and as soon as you get me in that yeah. just make sure there's not a piece of camera equipment around because i'm getting everything canceled well crew is crew is key you know that's yeah. the best way to go but unfortunately we can't be on this podcast because 
yeah, we, we, we've had a couple of guests that have uh, put us into the, you know, different lane from YouTube. But <laughs> the algorithm's like, no. Yeah, <laughs> they're like, oh, they like you, though. I see that they like Jesus. you. What, by the way, what are you up to on, on YouTube right now? I, I don't know. I think it's an adult film platform for me. No, but what what not, what subscribers you have? Oh, uh, <laughs> sorry. I thought you meant what we do there. Oh, a lot of various shaped objects going in me. Huh? Oh. Ooh. Just had an extra couple of uh, thousand subscribers. Looking for the wrong things, of course. Just flex. We will do anything for views. Oh. I don't give a shit. My body is simply a vessel for YouTube views. Oh, jeez. I don't care how sore I have to be the next day. Or if I have to go to the gastroenterologist to get things that we lost up there taken out. I hope you toweled yourself off before sitting on that sofa today. Flex, unfortunately, I'm always covered in my own filth. <laughs> it's terrible. I usually have butlers follow me around to clean that up, but uh, <laughs> they're in the helicopter today. Um, <laughs> YouTube. Uh, 1.27 million or something? Yeah, I, listen, the YouTube thing just blew up on us like in the last year, and I got to say... There's a lot of people with dog shit taste out there because if you think I'm funny, holy shit, you have no friends. It's awful. You probably don't see people day to day because anyone's funnier than me. You just don't have anyone to talk to you in real life. So you turn me on. Ooh, turn me on. And then, uh, yeah, Mr. Nick Shaw, the CEO of RP, just ends up getting all that YouTube money. Flex, do you know that I don't get paid for YouTube? What? I get nothing at all. I don't even get paid for the apps at RP. Nick will send me lunch money sometimes to make sure that, like, I'm fed enough to go on the channel. Uh, but other than that, he says, hey, it's all for the big play later. And I believe him. So yeah. I'm still here working really hard. It's been 10 years, but I feel like he's going to reward me soon. Uh, he's probably just uh, putting in an office, uh, overseas bank account, maybe, you know, for, yes. for a retirement plan. I don't for know. us. Yes. For me. Hold on to that thought. He cares about me, right? I think so he must so anyway that's youtube it's good <laughs> it is good though but this is what you bring i guess it's it's a true version of yourself what you see in the gym outside of you screaming at somebody training yeah sure we do a that part no yeah but what you see when you meet you you know you you, you if it's something in the you meet somebody in the store or yeah. you meet somebody at an expo this is who you are and when you get a camera on you i think that it's just you have an ability. Like more of the same. <laughs> Just more of the same, yeah. You double down. You uh, double down. This on guy the, would do something different. Yeah. <laughs> but the science element of things, that's truly what's been lacking from a lot of this YouTube. You know, everybody's a YouTube coach. And going back to what I said earlier, everybody's a trainer now, right? But everybody's yeah. now going, using their platform to put information out there. And it's so skewed from the reality of things. And, and sure. as you're science-based, evidence-based... That's the difference between you and, you know, a bro chat guy, right? No offense to who has podcasts. No, when I talk about bro chat. Oh, my God. You just, <laughs> bro science. You just started the Jedi versus Oh, Sith Jesus. Lord, Fuad, Lord. come on. I said bro chat in the gym, I should have said, right? Wait, Fuad, you listen up. You come to battle me any time. You got yourself a dragon? No, you don't. Hey, you're leaving, so you're going to shit talk and you're off back to... Hey, what's he going to do? He's going to show Michigan. up and the dragon's going to come up. Flex, come on now. <laughs> no, but the science-based is what defines you, right? Let's, let's be honest. All jokes aside, it's yeah, it, it's something that you got a PhD for, doctor next to your name, you've got true letters, sure. um, and something that's earned. And when yeah. you get in and you're around all this nonsense, as somebody who's highly educated, mm -hmm. how much does it piss you off to you or some of this well, stuff? Well, I got I got an answer for you, Flex. Part of it doesn't piss me off at all because science only knows so much and the grand truth of the world, how things really work, it's like science is a flashlight and the grand truth is this whole room. You can't put the flashlight on the room at the same time. Dark room. So sometimes when I see bodybuilders, especially thoughtful people, people in the know, doing things that look like science doesn't know what to say about them, or science has said something different about them, but with recreationally trained undergraduates that weigh 70 kilos. No offense, I know that's your current body weight, Fleck. <laughs> I gotta build these questions up yeah. after this, bro. <laughs> You need to pull me back in. I'm sorry, JK. <laughs> Guys, right now I'm with Flex Lewis. I think he weighs 280. As far as I can tell, it's just so much of him. I will say you are unreasonably lean for being retired. Like, why are you jacked and lean I, still? I can't even get any smaller. I Have tried. you tried smoking cigarettes? No. But not, no. But you're European. I never got into that, by the way. Dennis Wolf was. Are you one of the only Welsh people that doesn't smoke cigarettes? Or vape. <laughs> That's the new cool thing, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. You can vape. Va vaping doesn't take the pounds off like cigarettes did yeah. in the 80s, you know? The model diet, cocaine and cigarettes. 
Are we getting cancelled yet? No, no. But I do want to, re- to return to that, actually. But yes, but, yes. But first, first question <laughs> yes, first. Yes, yes, yes. So sometimes when I see stuff that's unscientific and people are doing it that seem to have good effects, seem to have thought it through, it makes me very curious. And I hope slash, well, RP funds a lot of science to study that some, someday to see if we can learn a lot. Because a lot of what the bros slash pros had going in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, they were just right about a lot of shit. And they didn't have science. They were just reasoning about it and using their experience. Like, mm. if this kind of curl gives me a gnarly pump and this kind of curl hurts my elbow, I'm telling you what, man, I'm doing the first call. I don't give what science says. And if science got nothing to say about it, I don't give it. So half the time that I look at people doing things that are not scientific, I'm like, oh, dope. That's it's interesting. It's very interesting. I, I wonder if it works. And maybe it does. The other half, this is especially a problem when people do things that are say, directly contradicted by science and they don't even make any sense. Like, you guys will see people will do like one arm dumbbell rows. They'll do the mid-range only, and they'll use, like, the 200-pound dumbbell because it exists in their gym. Nothing wrong with that doing for the soul because sometimes you just got to live a little bit. Science, reality, I'm trying to rip my lat off. <laughs> yeah. but, but outside of just fuck, which is fun to do with your friends every now and again, you can't tell me this is a serious attempt at hypertrophy training, what you're doing. We already know the stretch is awesome for muscle growth. We already know that full control of the load is awesome for muscle growth. If you don't, follow Nick Walker on social media and watch a 290-pound person train with full control. So, like, what the are you doing? And if you ask someone, maybe not at the right time, they'll be like, yeah, man, just kind of like, you know. Shut up. Shut the fuck up. You didn't think your way into this. There's no reason to explain yourself out of it. You're just doing dumb shit. Like, yeah, I guess. You don't ever get them to admit that. So when I see a lot of et cetera, if it doesn't contradict science, or if it contradicts it in a different circumstance with thought, I'm very curious, and it's awesome. The other hand is when I see unscientific things and they're just dumb as... I'm like, didn't we solve this problem already? So to your point, yeah, it is a little frustrating sometimes. Where does the intrigue meet though, for you? <laughs> <laughs> like a very thin line of is this yeah. intrigue. You know, like um, sometimes different hand positions and foot positions and various mm-hmm. exercises, different flaring of the elbows. Some people will be like, this is the only way to train your rear delts, which is such nonsense. There's a tons of different ways. Now, this could be maybe one of the best. They rarely couch it like that. <clears throat> On the other hand, there's people who are like, hey, I like this. This works for me. Try it yourself. Maybe a little bit of anatomical reasoning behind it. I'd stretch the delta bit more. And that's kind of on that side of, is this is this real shit? If there's some reasoning behind it, there's some decent attempt to not pretend you know everything and this is the ultimate exercise, I'm in. But there's a very short walk from that to be like, this is it, man. I only train delts like this. And it's like, okay, very well. Go go ahead and make things up. <laughs> so is there any type of outdated advice that um, that you think should not have become archaic? Such as... Um, oh. I've got tons flex. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Since you've got that, I was going to give you an... Yeah. yeah, okay, let's go. Go heavy to grow muscle. Go light for pre-contest to burn fat. It turns out that what you want to do in muscle growth training is train anywhere between roughly five rep sets and 30 rep sets. There are no wrong answers. If there were really, really wrong answers, how much more gear are Milos' guys taking to be able to show up on stage bigger than damn near everyone and ripped? I'll text him. him. (laughs) Excuse me, Milos. Don't mean to bother you, but he's got his guys doing mega triple drop marathon sets of 25, 30, 40 reps. They're growing goddamn just fine. I've done also, them. Yeah, it's awful, but it works. And so it, it'd be weird to have someone who weighs 150 pounds watch you, you personally, or one of Milos's guys, like one of these jacked animals, do a 20 rep workout, you know, 20 rep sets, and be like, yeah, man, so pre-contest, right? Milos section is peak off season. They're like, yeah, but do you want him to go heavier to grow? Like, you didn't think Milos thought that through, you asshole. A lot of the thing is, uh, so, so that's a big myth, right? And also, you don't burn fat much by training with higher reps in the gym. Your diet burns fat. Your cardio burns fat. You know, if you were to walk up to a regular person at the shopping mall, to a, to a bodybuilder, you're a regular person, and you're like, hey, man, did you get those? He's lean. Let's say he's really lean. You, you etched in the striations with high rep concentration girls, right? He could be like, ha, well, yeah, that's part of the equation. But like... How much talk is there backstage at a pro show about, like, yeah, man, you really etched those details with high reps? People are like, what the? Yeah, it's not Ronnie really did like, sets of eight before the Olympia, you dumbass. It's like, what are you eating over there? And that's not really my conversation. It's like, <laughs> give sure. me some of that shit. Give me like that pizza. It's like in, uh, vascular, get some vascular. Oh, yeah, there you go. Um, but, yeah, so so the myths, the myths that, that what is the kind of the, the biggest myth that pisses you off the most out of all? Well, it's got to be a question of, like, today because it, it changes. changes. 
Okay, give me two then. One of old, one of new. I would say the extreme emphasis on training to failure. Really? Yeah. The thing is, your muscles will grow very well if you train close to failure, within three reps away from failure. And time after time after time, it's been shown that the distance between three and zero reps to failure almost doesn't matter, or very nuanced. Science-based. Science-based, yeah. And so if you stop all of your sets one rep shy of failure, and you stimulate the muscle enough for it to grow, you're going to grow incredibly well. If you're going to go all the way to failure, there's probably not a damn thing wrong with that. There are some nuanced critiques you can make of both that and doing three reps in reserve. But on average, it's very, very similar. There's a reason people like to exalt training to failure because it makes them feel manly because they want to go into the gym and do two things. One is grow muscle. Makes sense. The other is to push themselves hard for that cathartic psychological effect. And there's not a goddamn thing wrong with that effect unless you're training to failure so often that your fatigue is becoming excessive. And then your need to beat yourself up in the gym is going to cost you is going to cost you rounds in the bodybuilding stage and it's going to cost you placings because if you look up and beat up and super tired you have enough high cortisol that your glutes are watery nobody gives up how hard you went again remember that like earlier conversation the judges have no idea a couple things one what you ate that morning or your whole prep two how much you weigh and three how you trained can you imagine flex a judge being like oh, looks like you did lateral raises that's one rank for me what so a lot of people go into the gym with kind of pretend one purpose, but it's really two. One is to get the stimulus they need. What was that Lee Haney quote? Stimulate, don't annihilate? Uh, yeah, stimulate, don't annihilate. Yeah. Correct, yes. Uh, also applies to masturbation. Sure. Although on some days you really do have to annihilate. Yeah, that, that's a yeah, touchy subject, but okay. Literally touchy. Is there a video to this? Um, Are we on video? We're on Spotify on video. Oh, perfect. Sorry, Spotify viewers, but you don't get to see what Flex and I actually did. <laughs> we're actually naked. It turns out they're like, we actually have Spotify video. Like, oh, <laughs> sorry to lie to you, we were not naked. But uh, By the way, Spotify is is big for us. No way. Yeah, it's, it's, it's right, Tyus? Yeah, yeah. You're in the top 3% of all uh, everything on Spotify. Holy top shit. Top 3% I Spotify. should have prepared for this. You should have. But you doing well. Hat. You're doing well. Fair play. Keep, oh, stop. keep going. Thank you two so much. Thumbs. Two thumbs I'm for Spotify. Now. Usually two thumbs in my industry means something totally different. And it's on Spotify, so it can mean whatever it wants to. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so guys go into the gym with seemingly one goal to train for, let's say, the bodybuilding event. But ends up either you can bifurcate it into two goals. One is to do a good job, stimulate, not annihilate. Mm -hmm. And the other is to get some demons off your chest. Now, fortunately or unfortunately for me, I had so many demons to get off my chest. I actually started doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu to get them off. <laughs> to get off. Huh? Um, but uh, to me, it's not enough just to bodybuild because if I only bodybuilded to do demon shit, I would be doing triple drop sets all the time. And it would beat me up so much that it wouldn't be the optimal. Because remember, there's two facts to growing muscle. One is stimulation. The other is recovery. And if you just go high volume all the way to failure all the time, you may not be able to recover. So mm. go hard in the gym. And if you want to train a failure, slow clap. Okay. Awesome. And don't pat yourself too hard on the back about it because is it more hardcore to train to failure? Sure, by a teeny little margin. It's much more hardcore to stick to your diet for 16 weeks. It's much more hardcore to beat the logbook and track all your weights and reps and sets. It's much more hardcore to be super consistent. If you want to try real hard in the gym and go all the way to failure, dope, there are many contexts for that. Just don't pretend like everyone who doesn't train all the way to failure sucks. Flex, you may remember this, but the vast majority of the 90s greats did not go to failure. I don't know if I've ever seen Flex Wheeler approach 5 RIR or whatever that was. And people just be like, yeah, man, it's all genetics. They're like, really? Because the modern guys don't have genetics? Yeah. What are you, crazy? Yeah. That Okay, fine. Here's another thing that pisses me off. Here we go. Last one, I promise. Oh, no, no. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, keep it going. When people selectively cite a few bodybuilders that they know of or that they're their favorites that embody their way of training to say this is how the top guys train. Interesting. So, so yes. much so that people still cite Dorian, Ronnie, and Jay often <clears throat> about, like, that's how you really got to do it. I'm like, first of all, Dorian trained just fine, Three but didn't do, a, didn't do a ton of volume. Ronnie did every muscle group twice a week with a load of volume, and he went so heavy it was unreasonable for everyone except for Ronnie to do it. 
So shut up. You're not Ronnie. Third of all, Jay Cutler is quoted literally on YouTube as saying he's never gone to failure. He always used a real controlled style. He was never like a psycho in the gym. He was more of a meticulous guy. So when you cite those three guys as like, I've this has been cited to me a ton on Instagram for like, this is a pussy RIR shit. You got to train like these guys. You said, but actually Jay Cutler says he's never gone to failure. And they just don't have anything to say because to them, there's like these, these four horsemen of the apocalypse, Ronnie, Jay, Dorian, and Branch, why not? Right? And like Branch is everyone's spirit animal because he's just like Texas writ large. Yeah. He's Texas as a human being. Like, I don't give what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Which is sweet. But then when you have people that are also unbelievable at their mm. sport, training in a style that isn't, oh, I don't want to say this, isn't as sexy, I guess, to so the bros. Such as who? B- Big Rami. How much of his training lore have you heard? Yeah. I haven't heard a ton. I've seen him do six plates on a high bar squat deepest for like eight reps. Yeah. But like, I guess it just doesn't, because he didn't bleed out of his face, that just doesn't make the reels or whatever. Usually he uses a really large range of motion. Usually it's under good control. It's plenty of exercises that are pretty conventional. You know, yeah. whatever they have that oxygen gym that's like super fancy and shit. So another one is Seabum. Seabum's the, the best current modern bodybuilder. Here's, here's another one. Uh, Derek Lunsford. What is he really known for in training? Be like, yeah, man, you got to go hard like Derek. Like, oh, how hard does he go? Like, uh, I'm not sure. I, uh, I've seen him do some rows or something. No one talks about that. So there's tons of guys that are just straight up as good as the greats or superior to them. Oh, I got another one for you, bro. And no offense, no offense, man. He's going to punch me in the face when he never sees me in real life because I'm irrelevant and he's a god. Phil Heath. How many stories about him just going crazy with steel have you ever heard going psychotically beyond failure and yelling there is nothing of him on the internet as far as i've seen of that why are we still citing ronnie and jay i know ronnie and jay are gods forever but why are you citing them and not citing phil heath did he just disappear into thin air what about sean roden i've never heard anything about people like yeah man i've trained like sean dude show up punch my card and go to work dexter 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 Dexter. That's the top of the tree for me. Dude, so Dexter, <clears throat> is seemingly his entire career has been choosing exercises very intelligently, controlling his range of motion and cadence intelligently. And I remember being a little bit, honestly, demotivated reading about him in my early days, early 2000s, you know, sort of beginning websites, Flex Magazine type of shit. Because all the other, I don't know, a lot of the other guys had some hardcore shit to say. Like, you watch one Branch Warren training video, you want to run through the gym wall to your next <laughs> session. Might make you jacked. When you look at how Dexter Jackson trains, there's nothing in there that lights a fire under you. But there's a reason Dex is competing for 30 years. He never broke. No. How are you supposed to break if everything's a, that meticulous? It's not sexy. True. So it just stuff with the bros, people are like, yeah, man, I don't know. Like, I'll post a video of me doing some stupid shit. They're like, yeah, man, I don't know. I'm going with Dorian. You're like, all right, I'm going with Ronnie. And they're like, uh, I'm going with... The Branch Warren. I'm like, Branch Warren wasn't as good as Ronnie. You lose. It's like a Jenga where you pull the long thing and everything <laughs> falls down. Why doesn't anyone cite Phil Heath? Why isn't anyone citing Chiron? Because there are two elements to training. There's how the top people actually train, which is, believe it or not, quite diverse. You've been around. You've seen it all. Guys train differently. And then there's the pretend shit we want them to train so that they hold up the spear, that bitch at the front of a ship, you know, our monument to how training should be. Not everyone's there, man. And yeah. you can't, you don't get to selectively cite people. What you can do if you're a pro and you like to train Dorian Yates style, blood, blood and guts, you're fatty. Is that okay to say or are you too banished for that? They think, oh, fair. Yeah, we're already like, too deep into this. Yeah, that's what she said. <laughs> I've never heard that personally. I'm not backing. Huh? Um, if you want to train like Dorian, just say that shit, bro. You don't have to say because Dorian was the best because there's eight other people that were also the best. All of them trained differently. Arnold, Lee Haney. How much have you heard about how Lee Haney trained? I mean, Lee Haney. If you t- look at the metrics, how much he weighed, how tall he was, and you look at pictures, like, did this, oh my, can you imagine Lee Haney at 20 years old with his exact genetics today? It would just be a matter of time until he was Mr. Olympia yeah. again. Be like, everyone can feel free to quit. He trained not in that spiritual style of psychosis. And I'm not even dogging on that style, bro. That coming into the gym, I remember coming to the gym for my leg workouts. I still do. Nervous. I could get hurt. And if I don't get hurt, I'm still nervous because it's going to be so much pain and worse. Flex, you know, towards the end of especially a set of legs where you know you have another rep or two left, but the pain is screaming at you so much and the fear of injury is screaming so much that you're like, you have to do everything to grab those leg press handles and be like, shut that up and just do this. That makes me nervous to think about. 
But is that the only effective way to train? No, it's just fun and it works, but it's not for everywhere at all times. So if you want to train like that gritty mentality, just own up to the fact of like, hey, I love Dorian's physique. I love a ton of other guys. I want to train how Dorian trained because it really fits my mojo. Like that's what gets me going. But you don't have to talk shit about other people's training styles because there's at least as many examples of RIR winning Olympia as Dorian. Well, the, the training of failure element of things, I, see, I, f- I truly feel a number of years ago, there was the team no sleep, train to failure. <laughs> team you, no you sleep. Know, that you makes know a lot that, of sense. That? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sure. No days off. But you've yeah. seen these guys who are kind of pushing that narrative. They didn't do nothing on stage, right? They were kind of going crazy in the gym. They were picking up injuries and they were making a comeback, whatever else. The, the biggest connector on the dots for these type of guys, now that I know these people, were they didn't take enough recovery days. Yeah, I would train five days a week and I'd spend the two days, one being a Saturday, one being a Wednesday, just on recovery. When I say recovery, I was literally having deep tissue. I was having anything that to do that was going to bring me back to the as close to that 100% version yes. of myself on that Thursday, yes. on that Sunday. Yes. And obviously Dorian training three days a week or four days a week, whatever it was, he spent more time recovering. That was his uh, hypothesis. I spoke to him when I was like 19 years old and I told him I was training six days a week with a badge of honor. And he would tell me, he's like, you only need to be in the gym like three or four days a week. Damn, dude. I'm like, he did you a quality service by I'm telling like, you some shit like that. What? Obviously, I grew up with the blood and guts too. So seeing that style of training, I also thought that was the only way to get to the top, right? Because yeah. we came from that, kind of that generation. Yeah. So hearing that you have to train that style and take more days off the gym when I was a gym rat and I loved the gym it was yes. very difficult for me so over the years I kind of created my own style of training obviously Neil's got his Y3T training style but for me when I was training before Neil um, I kind of had a hy- hybrid style and I'd done that most of my Olympia until Neil took the realm and mm-hmm. obviously I followed suit but with with my style it was a little it incorporated heavy high reps mm-hmm. so I don't know what your thoughts on this and, I, and please Obviously, forget the trophies, but I would I would go in, and you can dissect this. I would go in training shoulders, for example. I would have um, maybe I'd warm up, and that's something I always would do: warm up oh, my that's shoulders. Good idea. Yeah. yeah, warm up. That's a word that nobody knows Weird. these days. Yeah. And I would stretch, and then I would build up, probably get some some blood in the muscle with some high rep stuff, and then I'd probably end up without you know getting too much into my glycogen storage in in a, a press of some sort on the second exercise and i would go up to about five plates aside oh, it's all on youtube mike don't worry Damn. um <laughs> and then i would follow that up and then going over to the dumbbell rack and i would chase higher reps 20s to 30s and that bump that pump that burn was ridiculous Awful. i would bounce around though i would never have a consistent style no when i went on the road and i would train with branch on the road or i train with uh Ronnie or a train with whoever it would be, the the, the top the top of the tree. They had their set style and that was unbreakable. They wouldn't even think about doing high reps or they wouldn't think about doing you know eights to tens, whatever sure. it would be. Sure. Um, but what is your thought of the perfect training schedule, regardless of of what you've got on an app? If if you were to just say somebody who is not a beginner maybe more towards the advanced level, what, what would be a perfect trainer style, a trainer system that they should follow for how long and even what I just told you, is that something that is applicable to, to something you would be yeah. uh, science-based? Yeah, it's a really good question. I said the first way I look at analyzing training splits and styles is my first pass analysis is, can I find something very wrong with this? Right? So if you're, you know... <laughs> <laughs> There's an old um, old pic on the internet somewhere where this this lady is like taking a bathroom selfie and she's like just getting cleaned up to look my best for the day. But if you look really closely on the bathroom uh, uh, set up there, there's like a meth pipe. And you're like, <laughs> you forgot to take your meth pipe out of that picture, young lady. Shit. And so it's one of those like I'm looking for the meth pipe. Like, are you doing anything super stupid? Let me give an example. F. Oh, no, that's just smart. That's, you know, how are you supposed to get energy for the day if you're not meth out of your mind? Jesus. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, so, for example, if you are three weeks out and you're rocking 20 mgs of Halo and it makes you feel a certain way, 
kind of like Superman must feel when his eye lasers are turned on, <laughs> right? And you're like, you know what? I feel great. Let's do a double on the incline barbell bench press. And your old pecs are like, wait a minute. Pop. That's it. So if you're doing really ultra low reps, mm. that's concerning because you might not have thought through the injury risk. If you're doing exercises with like a dog shit range of motion, clearly for egotistical purposes, I'll be like, that's stupid. Another one is if you have a very strange arrangement of body parts. For example, <coughs> excuse you. My apologies. If you are doing Monday back, Tuesday biceps, and then no other pulling for the rest of the week, I have to ask you, do your biceps feel their best Tuesday? Because they back training them up. And it, it, wouldn't it be smart to move your biceps to like Wednesday or Thursday? Also, do your biceps take five days to recover or six days Because until the next back workout? And you might be like, no. Like, okay. So like, I guess I'm still a professor. Um, I was just saying when I was a professor, but when I was doing more professorial work, and now it's like a little bit of a part-time thing for me, I would actually have a program design exercises in class. And one of the things I would grade students on is like programmatic symmetry. Like whatever muscles you're training, do you think there's enough time for them to heal for next time? And do you think there's maybe too much? So you should you increase the frequency or spread things out more? So I would look at stuff like that. Another thing I would look at is total amount of training. If you're training three times a week, unless you're genetically very far outside the realm, it's probably just not enough to have your best physique on stage. You said you trained five. Mm -hmm. Our thing we say at RP is for advanced athletes to get the best results, we want them in the gym four, five, or six plus times a week. Six plus means some days you do two a day. Okay. Some people can recover from that sort of thing. Yeah. Jared Feather does nine sessions a week. So that is another thing I'll look at. And then the real question I'd have for the person whose program I'm evaluating, because it's a very easy to evaluate a program or a system just when it's written on paper. But I want to talk to the person that's doing it. Because if you looked at some of my training, you'd be like, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. And then I'm like, well, actually, you know, I have this pec injury from a long time ago, so I have to do biceps first. It warms me up more before I do chest. You'd be like, okay, that makes sense. So before we go critiquing any pro's plan, it's a really good idea to have the context and there's no better context than speaking to that person. So for your particular approach, uh, I actually said a lot of really good things. One is you warm up first. If you come in and just go heavy without a warm up set, I'm like, you're stupid or something, right? How critical is warm up? I mean, it improves your performance substantially. I don't mean getting on the treadmill for an hour or some shit, foam rolling your dick for half an hour, which may feel nice in your own home. Or in the gym, if you have enough clothes on, and you're not making weird faces, the people are like, that's for your dick, isn't yeah, it? You're like, no. Oh, oh, God, always it gives it away. So yeah, always, every time. So you don't have to do this crazy, crazy warm-up outside of your training, but at the very least, when you get your weights in your hand, go light for high reps, rest a little bit. Go a little heavier for lower reps, rest a little bit. Do one more set of like pretty close to your working weight, maybe your working weight. Rest a little bit, and then hit your first work set. So if you have like five plates on a hack squat, mm -hmm. do two plates for a set of 10. Do four plates for a set of eight. Do five plates for a double. Everything feels great. Then it's five plates for sets of eight to ten. Hmm. If you just like go in and put a bunch of weight on the hack squat, you don't really know how everything is working order. Your muscles and tendons or connective tissues are more cool. Uh, not cool like put on sunglasses and the hot girl cool, but like physically lower temperature. And it's just not rocket science to know that lower temperatures increase the fragility of various <laughs> objects. Right. So... Warming up is essential to being safe, and the nervous system wakes up more and more as you warm up, and it can recruit bigger and bigger fractions of your muscle fibers. So warming up is a really good idea, and that's on your checklist. Another thing you said is, at first you do some kind of higher rep work for a while, which is cool because when you get as strong as you have been at your prime, just going straight to the heavy shit right away is so much systemic fatigue. You know, just one does not simply incline or, or shoulder press five plates without feeling it. If someone asks you, like, where'd you feel that? You're like, I don't know, man. Everywhere. My toes feel that shit. I used to be a pretty decent overhead presser. So I've done, it's on YouTube, my best standing overhead press from clavicles all the way up. No leg drive is uh, 125 kilos, 275 for a set of eight at 240. That made my abs and quads cramp at the same time. So if I want bigger shoulders, which I do. I haven't standing barbell pressed in years. 
because first I'll do some higher up dumbbell stuff. Then I might go into pressing. It's not as impressive anymore, but because you've pre-exhausted, the target musculature is still stimulated, but you don't have to feel your joints up and shit. Imagine if instead of squatting high bar, uh, very heavy first, someone like Ronnie did some work to get in there, some leg presses, hacked squats, leg extensions. He might not have had to have gone that heavy and might not have cost as much systemic fatigue, so on and so forth. And another thing that you said was right on is once you get your heavier work out of the way, by the way, there's some very small amount of literature that seems to show that if you train both heavier and lighter in the same session, you actually get a little bit more growth than just training heavy, heavy or light, light. Yeah, of course. I found the literature. My man. I believe you I, I actually it. did, by the way. The dragon wrote it. <laughs> he just breathes fire and then all of a sudden it's just science to <laughs> Magical. No, there is some truth to it, to be honest, but it'll... But we won't go down there. <laughs> okay, very well. This, this is your show. No, very, oh, please, Jesus Christ. Um, but yeah, uh, I think that once you have done a good job with heavy stuff, there's that maybe additional benefit of going lighter. But also, you can't just keep going heavy, heavy, heavy because then you're too tired. Um, Dave Tate some, said something really smart uh, many times, but back in the day, one of my favorite quotes of his is something to the effect of he's a power lifter, right? A power lifting coach, great, actually a big part of the sport. And he said something like, you only have two exercises in one session on which you can truly go heavy, like squats and good mornings. Anything you do after that, you can pretend it's heavy, but it's such a small fraction of your fresh one rep max, you're just kind of wasting your time. However, after you go heavy, what used to feel a little heavy to you in the higher rep range, that's a 15, it feels so much lighter. You just pushed five plates over your head. The dumbbells aren't going to feel that heavy, and you're warmed up, and you're fresh, and your tissues feel great. Then you can crank out the high reps. So a very, not the workout, but a very good workout style is to show up, warm up, go heavy, couple exercises, sets of five to 10, five to 12 reps, and then a couple exercises after for sets of 10 to 20, even 15 to 30 repetitions. And the last thing you do can be like a drop set, superset, or something, but the last thing you do should in some sense be your hardest cardiovascular and fatigue thing because you're not doing dick after that. Like sometimes in the RP videos, we'll have people do a bunch of leg presses, then they'll get out when they're really close to failure and they'll do body weight squats to failure and they'll fall over. There's nothing planned for after that because you're so up, there's nothing else to do. So let's say your plan that you described to me lines up very well with a very effective way to train. Yeah, I feel like we have a lot of similarities, ideologies. and um, It's because we're both short. Well, I'm just, just kidding. Not sure. We're fucking smart as hell, but I went. Mm, you know. Well. <laughs> <I'll take laughs> uh, but yeah, there was a lot of body weight stuff that I done too. Oh, so, nice. So, well, and yesterday I was going to bring this up too. Yesterday I seen you doing uh, hamstrings, I believe, correct? Mm -hmm. hamstrings? And then you done some uh, body weight lunges, mm -hmm. and you done some uh, squatting uh, with the uh, with the wedge. With the wedge. Terrible. I'm sore. So myself, you can go back and see all the footage of of old. We would go ballistic in the gym and outside Boca Raton, my old, my old Dragon's mm -hmm. Land location. Mm -hmm. We do walking lunges outside, <coughs> followed by... Socks in Florida, it does, Jesus Christ. Followed by in the, uh, I call it in the pocket, whatever you want to call it, short range of motion. Um, it was kind of like a super set in a sense where it would be you squatting, but ask the grass, but you're only coming up maybe a foot, maybe a foot and a half, off. Time and attention on that is yes. after, after, I mean, look, if half of it was you, you tell you, it's probably about a hundred meter walking lunge, maybe more, so in the heat, and then followed up by that kind of little squat. Me, John De La Rosa, Frank McGrath, um, Rafael Brando, um, who else did I bring in for camp? Um, Kamal Elgani, mm -hmm. the, last, the last 2018, 2017 camp. Who I is in. seemingly immortal. He's like a hundred years old. Right. That, so uh, off the point, but coming on the point, Kamal was the first guest poser at my very first show. Wow. And he was the world champion. So they brought him in. He wasn't even a pro, right. but because he wanted to stay amateur, he's actually, he was sponsored by um, Bahrain, I believe. I hope I'm not wrong with this, but he was sponsored by the country mm -hmm. to stay amateur. Weird. He was making more money as an amateur, six figures as an amateur. I hope Kamal doesn't mind me talking this business as years ago anyway, so hopefully it's wrong. Um, I know that they were given condos and cars and everything else. Sam, Samuel, her dad, yeah, he, yeah, was, he was paid to, to stay amateur for the longest time. And the, obviously the 212 came, class came along and um, uh, Kamal had his pro card 
Oh, he actually lost it and had to petition for it again. Really? Oh, it's a rigor morale and that. I was involved with that too. This is a guy who I thought, what a beautiful story, right? Yeah. Kamal Ghani was banned by the IFBB in the European, mm-hmm. you know, Area. there was a lot of bullshit going uh-huh. on. I, was, I, I succumbed that. to that too, to be honest. Mm-hmm. I won't pop that cherry. But he fell under that old regime. And um, I was helping him get his pro card back to compete in the 212 class, which ended up being his first uh, year run. I think he came second to me. Yeah. Imagine how that would have been if I got him the pro card. He beat me. It's kind of like Son a, Ron, a Ro- Ronnie Flex Wheeler situation. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, I saw it. I was sitting back seeing this guy who was not even training at this point in time. He brought me over to his gym. And, uh, you know, great guy. I done an appearance there. Loads of people came out and. He was tiny, 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 tiny. Like, he just not wasn't training. And I go, come out, like, are you going to get back? I'd love to get back, but, you know, you know the situation. I go, I know I don't. I'm banned. What? I said, you start training. Start training, start eating. I'll work on the back end. Now, I didn't think it would take as long as it did because it took over a year and a half, maybe, to get this guy. Huh. So we ended up speaking to, you know, the boss man, Jim. And uh, Jim granted the, the IFBB Pro card. And I'll tell you what, how much hey, of a freak this to, guy. Can you speak to Jim on my behalf? Like, Dr. Mike's not that good at bodybuilding, but he doesn't have any friends. <laughs> Just watch this TikTok. Please. That's Just right. do a nice TikTok on Jim, and I'll send it to him. I should. There we go. But yeah, this is how much of a freak Kamal is. Bounce back within two years of not even being good, but better than what he was before. So my question is, some of these guys who are masters, athletes, who have taken you know, their time in earlier years looked phenomenal. They've had some time away, family, business, whatever it is, they get back into the sport. I personally have seen, such as Kamal, rebound back to not only be better, but that muscle looks fresh, it looks young. Obviously, in some circumstances, they're coming with the territory of whatever they left the sport with, the injuries and stuff like this. But what is it that somebody that's in the realm of Kamal has taken some time away from the gym and then to bounce back and look like the way he has. Generics, or is it more than? Middle Easterners are just better at bodybuilding. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it that. Just kidding. Specifically Arabs, they're just awesome. Unbelievable. Oh. Um, that is also true. But um, it turns out we've known in sports science circles for a long time, not specific to every sport, but bodybuilding hasn't been formally studied all that much, though that's changing, that... It's uh, two things. One, it's really hard to make elite level gains for the first time. You don't just get Kamal's physique or anything like it by just, ah, so good genetics, right? Because he also has good genetics, and he trained for a lifetime to get that physique. Mm-hmm. However, quote unquote muscle memory is really a thing. And the part two of this is that it's really, really powerful. In a way that's almost um, unjust to people that think you've got to keep grinding to keep the gains. You don't. Now, approximately, you will look much smaller if you don't train. You don't train for six months. You look like, oh, that guy, is he he sick or something? Can you handle it psychologically? If you can, you start training again. You thread the supplements back in again. You start eating again your body will regrow to its earlier size quick. I'm talking about months, not years. Kevin Lavrone used to do it every year. Perfect example. And people used to think Kevin was an outlier. But here's the problem. Almost everyone can do something like that. The number one reason why most of us don't is, one, some of us just aren't in this for a long haul. Like you're quitting by age 38. Let's just do this and get it over with. I'm not trying to be 57 and winning Mr. Olympia. Talking to me? Well, did you quit at 38? Yeah. There you go. Perfect. Because I didn't message that, right? You know, because if someone told you, like, in the middle of your Olymp- Olympia run, be like, hey, take a bunch of months off, you'd be like, the mate, you're fucking looking in my eyes and saying that. I'm on a mission. Have you met me, dragon? And they're like, I don't want to meet the dragon. Good. Oh, that dragon. Bit of a weed dragon, any? I'm kidding. Must be legendary. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay. You're redeemed. Good, good, good. You make it to me. Good, good. Thank you so much. So on the other, on the one hand, it's like yes, you, know, so you, you lose six months, you lose six months. Mm-hmm. However, people think, people think that if you back off and you stop training for six months, 
they get paranoid. Yeah. They're just all gone. I'll never get it back. And they think, sort of understandably, they look back and go, how hard was it to get this mask last time? Well, it took me 15 years. It took me 15 years to go from 180 to 220 pounds, let's just say. Then I'm back to 185 after six months not training. I say I broke my leg or something. Dude, some people quit forever because it's, I don't have another 15 years to get up to 220. The, the reality is to get up to 220, just as lean and muscular as before, might take you six to eight months. And that transformation is so baffling. It's impressive to see yourself go through it. It's awesome. The vast majority of the reason that people don't ever take some time off is because they are straight up addicted to looking their best or damn near all the time. In a hoodie. In a hoodie. Three hoodies. Layering them in. I don't want anyone at the gym to think I'm small. People do that, man. Oh, I know. Yeah. And it's one of these things where um, one thing I can tell about Kamal, having never met him, is I guarantee you he's psychologically pretty sound, at least in the respect of like, he's totally cool to not be super jacked. You do talk to him, he's probably like, yeah, I'm just living my life and doing this and that. And you're like, aren't you in constant existential pain from not being as jacked as you were before? He's like, no, I actually feel quite fine. And then he picks up the sport again, and he also feels good doing that. Lastly, the fact that he's had such a long career is not unrelated to the fact that he could uh, drop the ball every now and again and not train in uh, especially Eastern European sports science, Ger East Germans, Russians, things like that, they knew that there was only a certain amount of hard training any athlete had in them in their entire lives. And they knew that they needed them to be the best for the world championships and for the Olympics. So after the world championships, the Olympics every time, they would have one to three months almost completely off of all sporting activity. They had a few months of general physical preparedness where they just get you basically back in shape to train. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then for six to eight months, they would train really hard, Peaking, winning, and then going back. What I've tend to notice from, because back in the old days in, in the old country, it was coaches that told you what to do. There was a completely coached system. There was actually no literal personal freedom. So you weren't just doing shit by yourself. There were no bodybuilding gyms, right? So, but in the United States, in Western Europe, Wales, et cetera, and people are totally free to do what they want. And the people that are the best at bodybuilding are the most addicted to bodybuilding, and they almost never give it up. Ronnie Coleman took one to three months away after each Olympia to just do diddly dick, right? And people will be like, yeah, Ronnie could do that because he's a freak. No, almost everyone should be doing that. I've got a yeah. YouTube video coming out in a little while on our channel titled something clickbaity but true, like everyone should take a month off per year. And that's just going to fall on not a lot of deaf ears but a lot of upset ears because you know what? I'm upset about it, Flex. I don't want reality to be like that. I love training. I love looking my best. It's hard for me to put it down. And by it, I mean the needle, but also the dumbbell. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's, it, you know, it's, it, Flex, it's tough to look at yourself in the mirror yeah. and be like, imagine like someone doesn't know you. You go and sit on a plane to go to Australia for a seminar mm -hmm. and they start chatting you up. And let's say you're like not training or not on shit and you weigh like 190, right? And, and they're going to be like, oh, so, so what are you doing? Like, well, I'm actually, I'm a, you know, really I'm a professional bodybuilder. And they're like, oh, interesting. Like, um, I, uh, I have a little brother. He's like a little bit bigger than you, but you're like, nobody's bigger than me. You're right. You're right, cunt. You were in, you were in, you're in, uh, uh, you heard it? Oh, yeah. But, uh, you know, so it's it's tough to even exist in a yeah. suboptimal form. But true athletes have one thing that many other people do not. Vision for the long term. Yeah. Give up how I look right now. It'd be funny for me to talk to someone who didn't think I was that jacked. And then they see you six months later and they're like, oh, my God. Be like, yeah, we turn it up and we turn it down and we know when and how to do it. To Kamal's life legacy, like, that'll keep you around a long time. Yeah. Especially not being pumped full of gear all the goddamn That's true. time. I know guys that not only do they never come off, which is fine if you go to TRT, their idea of TRT oh my is measured in grams instead of milligrams. It's and then I was like, yeah, you're just not really long for the sport because your body can only take so much of a beating until your liver <sighs> smokes its last cigarette and <laughs> puts it out on your heart. <laughs> there, there was something I wanted to mention, and, and I know we're kind of restricted on time. What have you got left that you can... Time-wise? Yeah. Shit, I'm here all day, baby. No, you got a... You <laughs> I know, gotta, yeah. JK. Uh, you know, five minutes, something okay, like that. Okay. Yeah. Firstly, thank you. Dude, of course. Um, you mentioned... Um, oh, this is where we align. Also, again, every year, every year, I would take off a month. Yeah, maybe longer. Really good idea. And it, do you know why? And I use this analogy, and I've, and I've put it on to any people who's around me. Now, I don't coach anybody for a reason. Because I'm a psycho when it comes to that. It's like... No, I don't coach either because I just... It drives me nuts. I'm not allowed to request athlete photos anymore due to a misunderstanding. Yeah, but it's not case, you know... It's, it's, it's Still in Massachusetts, oh, district court, dang unfortunately. It, dang it. They just don't understand humor is what I'm saying. But you pay the... I wanted the athletes to be bottomless because dick striations are important. Not because the judges will see it, but if your dick's lean, you're good, bro. Again, something we align on again. But 100%. Something else we align on. Yes. Um, I took that month, month and a half off many times. Spoke to Ronnie. Me and Ronnie done a 
a uh, three a month tour of Australia. So him and I were together for for the most part that month. Or we meet up periodically. So we went to Australia, New mm-hmm. Zealand, mm-hmm. us flying in prop planes together, just us Jesus two together Christ, with yeah. no seats inside. I, was, I got the stories. <laughs> but shit. I had the chance to not only train with Ronnie, granted he was post, uh, you know, peak, mm-hmm. but the knowledge that guy had. And it was truly, wasn't asked of anything. He would just tell me stuff. Very cool. And he'd ask me, he's like, uh, you taking a break now? Etc. How long do you take a break for? And I would ask you. You were like, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was. Yeah. I want again. It's Ronnie, right? He's like you're fucking hardcore. Mm-hmm. He's like, yeah, I would take a month off. I'm not going to do his accent. Um, yeah, but, but you but, want me to try? <laughs> I was uh, well, Flex, you better take a month off because, well, technically speaking, you don't look so good to me, man. That's a little Mike Tyson stroke. It's Ronnie. a little bit of both. I, it's I, just yeah. as terrible as my accent. It's awful. But we, <laughs> but Ron, Ronnie told me that, and I was like. You took a month off? And he goes, yeah, but just travel, guest pause. I said, you weren't worried about being not in shape? He goes, no. I'm like, no. Right. And There's not, they're not giving awards out for no. guest posing. And he was getting paid regardless. Yeah. Right? Everybody's seen, sure. there to see Ronnie. And Ronnie obviously would just blow up into this creature walking on the stage, casting shadows and the clips <laughs> and the lights. Sure. But this guy truly said he prolonged his career by taking that time off. So it's very yeah. interesting that you're bringing this, this video out because I won will stand next to that and say, I've done it too. Um, and not only that, psychologically. See, Huge. I played a lot of psychological warfare on myself. No, girl, guy, wife, girlfriend, whatever it is. If you're with somebody every day, you become complacent. You, you're like, ah, you know, I see her, I see him, whatever. She knows I love her. You go on the road for X amount of time. You go for a week, weekend, month. You're going to miss that. And that's oh, what yeah. the gym was to me. I started missing the gym for all its pros and cons. Did you get sick of the gym towards the end of prep? Oh, man. I was just, I was turning up for Sitting work. Sitting in your parking lot in the car, just like. Talking to myself. Yeah. Then in. Yeah. Then in. I know we kind of run in the, the, the podcast, but um, we've, we've talked for 90 minutes. But I did want to talk about the mental element of things because I'm a big mentalist. I don't know if you have time to talk about that. Uh, I do. I can say a couple of quick quips. Absolutely. Convey some semblance of wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> um, me- mentality element of things, psychological warfare. Yes. I would truly talk to myself, go into the gym. Yep. I would have this moments of the day where it's like calm before the storm. I wouldn't allow anything to kind of aggravate me. But when I was going to the gym, it was kind of like. Yeah. I, I, if somebody was next to me, I'd probably like a psycho rocking yeah. myself. I'd just into certain music. There was this build up. And then there was this implosion, and then I put it all into the box and turned it, I call it Pandora's box. Mentally, what was what is something that you do that separate the pack, and what is something that you like to put upon your athletes that may have the genetic potential, yeah. but they're not tapping in mentally? Yes. What you demand from them as yeah. one of your athletes? Yeah, I can say a few things about that Please. really quick. One is if you're always laser focused, super hardcore, you're going to burn out because if you don't burn out, you're just chronically elevating your cortisol, which we know is so good for bodybuilding results. JK, it's terrible. So there's no reason to listen to death metal every waking second that you're awake and just go through bodybuilding means, show up, train, and then go through more bodybuilding means of death metal. So that's definitely a mistake. Another mistake is uh, being relaxed all the time. You see guys in the gym training for the pro show. Like, oh, somebody, what the, f- are you trying? Is this a long warm up? On is that this, thing. Is this five? <laughs> yeah, on that is thing. It, yeah, yeah. Is it exactly like, you know, DM and hose and shit like that. There's just nothing wrong with that, but at least do some hard work sets. Some people just can't turn it up. True champions have that combo. They are chill during the day and during the evening, chill as could be. You, you could punch me in the face outside of my gym sessions. I'd be like, oh, uh, hello. <laughs> you seem to have misplaced your fist. <laughs> um, you should be so chill because chill means uh, you are in a state of nervous system activity which promotes recovery and adaptation. Isn't that what the f- you want? And when you start to do your ritual for going to the gym, the closer you get to those work sets, the more you winnow it down into a fine laser point of violence. You want to see that in real life? Joe Sullivan, who trains at your gym, one of the all-time greats in powerlifting. I took a video of him meditating in the middle of the gym. Love it. But he's not meditating for peace. He's meditating for war. And that zone in turns Joe Sullivan, who's normally a cheery, cool guy, into a person I don't want to walk between him and his hack squat when he's about to go. Being a champion athlete means mastering your psyche to be chill almost all the time, except for right before that violence set. And if you can, really lead. 
is as soon as your work set is over, you're back chill, chatting with people and everything. Next work set, headphones go in or bad dreams from childhood go in and you go back to crazy psychosis. That ability to go in and hit it, but also retract and withdraw and be super, super chill gives you the most stimulus in your workouts and the most recovery outside. There is no superior way to do things. Just being chill all the time doesn't work because you got to train. And just being super psychotic all the time usually just lands you in the mental hospital. But if it doesn't, it'll drain you of everything. My last prep went to- total shit because uh, I was trying to do the hardcore laser focus every waking second. And I accomplished some things in work and my physique looked okay, but I was tired, flex, and it showed. Yeah. And then recently I've been trying to live more of my own advice of get crazy in the gym and then take it easy everywhere else. And like I'm in the, on track to be the best I've ever done. And I just wish someone would have hit me over the head with a giant hammer to remind me of this shit, well, 20 years ago. So the, I was going to say in one of the questions, was there anything that you wish you could turn the clock back on? But, but we could probably land the plane on that. STDs. What? I'm not. Right. Uh, turn the clock back. I, I, uh, so I'll, I'll say a couple things. I generally don't like to dwell on that kind of stuff because we actually just, time machines are not realistic. I think people tragically um, go through things in their head that they could have done better. Well, mate, you've got a time machine somewhere. I like to like, say that people are a little bit depressed about shit that went, went bad. I'm like, listen, I'm working on a time machine. But until we get one going, you can just stop thinking about this shit altogether. But what I would say is my probably biggest regret, so to speak, is I gained a lot of weight chasing ultimate size as a natty. I was five foot six, lifetime drug free, and I weighed 270 pounds. 270? 270. Now, I was strong as squatting, yeah. 550 for reps and all okay. this other shit, benching, you know, whatever, 365 for eight. But uh, I just put so much, I had probably 30, 32% body fat, and I still have to deal with the body water issues it causes. I still have love handle skin. I would say if you're gaining weight, do so slowly so that you never lose sight of your abs. That's my only kind of regret. Yeah. But to be honest, anytime I get a regret, I just have my butlers pile on the $100 bills into my shower, and I just shower in money. And I tell you, Flex, there's no way to get over regrets better than oh, that. That's a great feeling, too. Isn't it? Unfortunately, I lost my butler to you, but you were paying a lot more. <laughs> but, um, listen, I know that we could go on for another 30 minutes. Yeah. This this is a, a genuinely intriguing, fun, and entertaining podcast. Uh, which is science based, I um, guess. Some, in some occasions. <laughs> some occasions. But we definitely, I, I selfishly, I'd love to have you back on for a part two. I think that I know the fans will be demanding this too. I would love to. Uh, send me a DM of something I like and maybe we'll get back. Didn't I send you several last time? I did like them, but yeah. I like them to completion and now I need more. Oh my God. <laughs> Mike, didn't I say that too? <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, straight out to there from myself. And this crazy, funny, with science-based and evidence-based. We're going to get him back for part two. And uh, truly a pleasure, mate. I, Thank I, you so I much, really Mike. enjoyed this podcast. I know that I have a lot of questions that I've done. My, I do my due diligence. I, I really do. I really do. And um, this is one that I really didn't even have a look at, uh, look at my notes on because it was so organic and so fresh. Okay. But next time, I'm going to be prepared for uh-huh. a lot of these, uh, no, with my jokes. Because okay, I felt <laughs> I felt short on my fast reactions today. But I thought, you know. <laughs> I if, thought you did great. Oh, thank you. I thought you did great too. <laughs> on that note, we are out.